Thank you so much, Mindy, and also Colleen, who everybody knows here at Fells, and our wonderful students, and John Lipinski, who runs Fells uh, as well. But most of all, thank you so much to Drs. Carrico uh, and Weissman, who are here today. And we are so lucky to have you. Um, at, Dr. Carrico is actually in Germany, where she has to get up at 5 a.m. to go to Cambridge, England, where she's giving uh, the um, Hawking lecture. She's a Hawking fellow. So we're, we're going to stop right at 7 Eastern because uh, you won't get any sleep at all otherwise. But thank you for joining us. And uh, Drew Weissman, Dr. Weissman, is um, just off a plane from Spain so and in New York. So uh, we're not going to go over at 7. I'm going to let them both go to sleep. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for being with us. We are just overwhelmed and honored and uh, our students at Penn are thrilled and a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of your fans from Philadelphia are here uh, and I'm at the top of the list. Um, literally, we are sitting here. A lot of our students are here and you may see them. They're actually in person, which is great finally, but we are here in part and it makes me almost tear up because of you in great part, uh, in person, in school. <clears throat> and also millions, literally millions are functioning globally in great part because of you, um, functioning almost as before, or hopefully soon, uh, without your incredible work, um, you know, really many people would have died or will die. Uh, you have actually helped prevent the deaths of countless of people, countless people, uh, and protected millions of lives of the rest of us. I mean, I'm a Moderna uh, Exhibit A, and I bless you. Um, many others have helped, but obviously you were critically important in the development of the of both the mRNA vaccines of Moderna and um, Pfizer. And by the way, I looked up in the US, 95% of vaccines to, to date in the US, which is 416 million as of today, doses given, 95% of them are the two mRNA COVID vaccines, um, which you helped enable. So no pressure, that's uh, pretty incredible. And uh, thank you, thank you from all of us. So everybody has your bio, I'm not gonna go on at length. I wanna use every minute that I can. Uh, everybody here on the Zoom has your bios, so please you know, look at them. I'm not going to go over them, but just briefly, Dr. Weissman is a professor currently here at Penn uh, in the Perelman School of Medicine. <clears throat> He's an inventor of many patents, BA and MA from Brandeis, uh, PhD and MD from um, Boston University, Boston School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Carrico, uh, Katie Carrico has been a senior vice president at BioNTech which is the RNA pharmaceutical company since 2013. Uh, she's also an adjunct associate professor here at Perelman School of Medicine, worked here for 24 years at Penn. So both Penn people, and we are proud of that. Um, Katie received her PhD in biochemistry from the University of Zagad in Hungary in 1982, has spent four decades, four decades on this research. Both of them um, have dedicated their lives in effect to this uh, with the ultimate goal of developing it for practical uses. Uh, briefly, they have won more awards than I will name here and many more to come, but they have won the um, $3 million Lasker Breakthrough Award. They have won the Horowitz Prize for groundbreaking work in medical science. They have won the Rosenstiel Award for science researchers who have transformed the field <clears throat> of medicine. Uh, they just this, just yesterday, I guess, Drew told me they won the Princess of Astoria Award in Spain, which is a very big Spain and Europe, uh, excuse me, award in Europe, uh, and and who knows uh, what is coming. So um, with that, I want to give one quick quick caveat for my first question. Um, a lot of these questions benefited from the tremendous amount of articles about you uh, and interviews you've done, which have been fabulous. I know you've been overwhelmed, and we all benefit from learning about you. But in particular, I want to uh, have a shout out if anybody wants to. I'm commending to you one in particular, which is the NYT, the New York Times Daily podcast by Michael Barbero and Gina Colada, which is just fabulous from June the 10th. And a lot of my questions come out of there. So I just wanted them to know that I appreciate it and, and you're welcome to take a look at it. So my very first question, can you tell us, and let's start with you, Katie, if okay, um, what or who inspired you? I know that you come, obviously people know you come from, from Hungary, uh, a, a house, you know, an Adobe house without running water uh, and that your father inspired you. Um, I'd love to know, you know, why and how did he inspire you or what else did? I think that many, many of the uh, children is inspired by their parents because, you know, that's their role model. And, uh, you know, my parents uh, taught us, uh, me and my sister, that um, 
hard work is part of life. And that's what we have seen, that perseverance, because it was hardship there. And um, we also worked and helped. And uh, of course, this was um, very important for me. And of course, in uh, school, even elementary school, I had excellent teachers. And uh, as uh, many of us, you know, can name our favorite teachers that, you know, we try to be like them. And my high school teacher knew so much about science that I wanted to be like him, you know, that I would, I would know that much as he knows. And uh, he was uh, as a great, uh, um, great uh, in science and in, in, and we discussed so many things actually that later in life I it, those things came back and so that was I was grew up as I in a small town 10,000 people so and in our family my father and mother had just elementary school education so you know I was not surrounded with professors in my families and but I just uh, tried my best. Um, well, quick follow-up before I get to you, Drew, I promise. Um, Katie, I would like you to tell briefly, there are two animal stories that I wanted you to note. Um, one is a pig story and one is a teddy bear story. Can you just give us a sentence on the pig, why the, how the pig is relevant and how the teddy bear is relevant? Yes, so my father was butcher and then actually we had garden, we had animals around and uh, I have seen chicken to hatch. Uh, because that's what we did, uh, you know, we had our chicken and also my father who was butcher and he, you know, processed the, the pig and uh, I was told that even when I was a little girl, I liked to watch it, whereas my sister and my mother went inside the house, they didn't like to see when the pig was open and what is inside and uh, I don't remember, but they said that I was always there and watching and, um, and of course we didn't have bear, but uh, coming to, to America from Hungary that um, in 1985, we were, you know, no credit card, Hungarian currency was not uh, uh, convertible. So we were allowed to leave the country, my husband and my two and a half years daughter with hundred dollar. And we, although in Hungary, hundred dollar was a lot, but you know, for a family to leave, to come to America, it was, very uh, limited. So we sold our Russian car and uh, exchanged in the black market the money and we saw in and 900 pounds. That's how we started our life. And then I saw inside the teddy bear and my daughter smuggled it to the US <laughs> so that we could have some money. <laughs> That's a beautiful story. And, and by the way, footnote from Penn, I know your daughter, I believe, has was is a Penn grad and won two Olympic gold medals. So I think it's a heck of a gene pool you, you got there. Um, that teddy bear maybe inspired her. Um, and by the way, I know you became obsessed at 22 and, and I, I gather you had to, you felt you had to leave to, to further this um, because you were visionary and saw that it, this, this had infinite potential. So blessings on you from 22, I, it's amazing. Drew, hello, you had a slightly less uh, sort of exotic background, I think. Um, or slightly less, uh, I can't, I don't have any animal stories for you to tell, but um, there's a great article, by the way, on you, uh, which interviewed your wife and daughters. So I'm counting the words we get from you. I know sometimes there's only 10 in a day. So I'm making a joke of that. We've talked about it, but uh, you're a man of few words and a huge brain. Anyway, tell us, um, you came uh, to Penn from Dr. Fauci's lab. Now we all know who Dr. Fauci is. I gather Katie didn't know who he was when she first heard about him, which is great from you, but what was it like working for him uh, briefly? Well, I, I spent seven years in Tony's lab. Uh, I, I did my fellowship training there. Um, it, it, it was an experience. I mean, Tony was a fantastic boss. He had a lab of about 120 people when I was there, but everybody met with him. Everybody talked with him. He was incredibly open to ideas. Uh, you know, it, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it, it, it shocked Penn a little bit because when I came from Tony's lab to Penn, uh, Harvey Friedman was trying to hire me. And you know, as we moved along, uh, Harvey asked me, so what kind of budget do you need? 
and, and I sat down and I calculated my body NIH and I gave it to Harvey and Harvey nearly had a heart attack because the, the budget I gave him was more than the entire ID division. Wow. And, and he had to convince me that I could survive on less money because that they had to give me less money to survive. That's fascinating. So that answers in a little little bit why you came to Penn. And but you know, I'd like you to be able, both of you, but particularly since you're since we, we're with you now, Drew, so many people helped you. I know you a little bit now, having spoken with you before. I mean, you're both so incredibly humble and modest. It's just exhilarating to know, you know, what you've done and, and your humility. Are there others in your lab you'd like to give a shout out to um, who obviously helped you, both at Penn and at Katie? I know you've mentioned some people before. Drew, are there any folks you want to thank here just because it's Penn? I mean, you know, the, 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 there's so many people it's hard to list. You know, the, there are people in my lab, so Norbert Pardee, uh, we started the vaccine research. We, we published the first mRNA LNP vaccine paper that described the platform, used it in monkeys, and showed that it worked incredibly well. Um, but you know, the, the, the reason that I came to Penn was because of its collaborative nature. And I, I currently work with about 150 labs worldwide on collaborations for vaccines, for therapeutics, for many uh, uh, RNA uh, projects. So that, you know, it's, the, I apologize, the number is so long, I, no, I no. can't miss everybody. No, that's great. And I, I, I sort of sprang, sprung that question on you. So um, I just wanted you to have an opportunity and Katie too, if you want anybody in particular to yeah. thank. Yes. I Actually, uh, for interesting thing, I mentioned that Drew uh, said uh, Norbert Pardee's name and Norbert uh, Pardee's grandfather and my father work in the same butcher shop in this small town. And I know, uh, know his father when he was a little boy, so I know the whole family. And when I visited my mother, he always came and he remembers then in, in my mother's kitchen in the small town, I told him this word, pseudo-uridine, he never heard before. <laughs> and uh, so I invited him over to, to work. But, but when I started at Penn in 89, um, it Elliot Barnett and at cardiology, it, he hired me and paid my salary and he expected that I would get my grants and I didn't get, but he still supported uh, my salary and it was important for me and he was enthusiastic about <clears throat> uh, making RNA and therapy and later uh, David Langer at um, uh, neurosurgery who was, I met him when he was a medical student at Penn, but later became um, a resident. And then he convinced the chairman that uh, neurosurgery needs a molecular biologist. And I get uh, my lab at neurosurgery. This is why neurosurgery, <laughs> we made the RNA. That's fabulous. Well, uh, thank you. I know you've always shared the credits. So I thought maybe it'd be nice to share it here, which you have. It must be amazing to go home to your families. Wow. They must... Um, I mean, if we're if we're in awe, I can imagine your your families. Um, and by the way, Drew, I have to tell you a footnote, which I want to tell everybody. I told you this. Drew is an evolved man, uh, by the way, because when I reached out to you first, because um, I could find you more easily at Penn uh, and not at, not quite so easily, Katie at Biontech. Drew said to me, "I would be happy to do your interview, Elizabeth, but only if Katie will do it with me." So we need to clone you, okay? Yeah, among Thank the, you. the men in the world. Thank um, you. So, <laughs> well, you're worthy. My next question. Um, so you both ended up doing research at Penn. How did you meet? It's a great story. How did you first meet? I, I was already working in neurosurgery, but I don't know. I was uh, going back to Department of Medicine. We work in different buildings, but that was an adjacent building. And I went there, you know, using uh, their Xerox machine. And uh, it was a real, real story. We met at the Xerox machine. And I was copying uh, from magazines, scientific magazines, article, and uh, Drew was doing, uh, and I don't know who, who was first, but we started to talk there. 
That's a great story, Drew. I know I think that you would agree on that. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, now I'm switching here. We are not scientists. We are, um, our students are wonderful masters of uh, public administration at the Fells Institute of Government. So with that caveat, um, this is a tough one. This is like a PhD thesis or a hundred of them. <clears throat> what would you, how would you define, uh, we're switching to the mRNA now. How would you define mRNA? And why is it called messenger RNA? Uh, and you can both take a crack at that. And the spike might be interesting to talk a little bit about how it blocks the spike protein, which we've all seen the little spiky ball. Drew, do you want to start with that? Or either one of you, I don't care. Well, what, Katie can start with the mRNA and I can do the spike. Great. Okay. So uh, the, the messenger RNA actually was discovered 61 uh, or 60 years ago in 1961. A scientist realized that uh, in the nucleus, there is all of the chromosome which contains the DNA, which is at that time in 1961 already knew that the information is there. And they realized also that the protein was made in the cytoplasma, but when they never found the DNA in the cytoplasma. So they knew that somehow the information where the protein is made, because we are made from protein, so the protein somehow uh, has to be made from something, but uh, they couldn't find the DNA. So they guessed that uh, probably there is an RNA and, uh, and then they identified that uh, from the nuclei, the RNA is uh, made from the DNA and it comes out to the cytoplasm and gives information to the protein uh, production machinery, how to, what to make. And that's what we are ending up. And from this protein could be an enzyme, which will make sugars or lipids or other things. So that's what we are made up with all of these basic uh, molecules. But uh, that's, uh, you know, the uh, blueprint of life. And uh, they also realized very early on that it is very labile. It, it is uh, translated, made the protein, and then it is gone. Great. Thank you, Drew. So we knew for coronaviruses that the spike protein was the critical component from 40 plus years of research on coronaviruses. So the, the minute the sequence was released and we knew it was a coronavirus, everybody immediately knew that the spike protein was the immunogen that had to be used in the vaccine. And, and that came from you know, research even before the, the first SARS epidemic came out and research from the SARS and the MERS epidemics. So just a sentence, and you sort of implied this, uh, a sentence really on, I think we, we hope to know this, but can you contrast this to other vaccines we know like smallpox and measles? Why, why is it so groundbreaking just briefly? What's groundbreaking is the platform. So for many vaccines, they're usually made of either an inactivated virus like flu. You grow the flu in eggs, you kill it, and then you vaccinate people with it. Or an attenuated virus, such as smallpox, where the, the virus doesn't give the same disease but it immunizes, it, it makes a response that stops the disease. Mm -hmm. There are also purified proteins like tetanus toxoid that are used for vaccines. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 vaccines, the, the RNA, this is the first time that nucleoside modified mRNA in lipid nanoparticles was approved by the FDA and EMSA and other groups to be used as a vaccine. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really, it's a brand new platform. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. And by the way, I'm, I'm running through these because we can read fortunately a lot and you've, you've done a lot of interviews. So, so I just really wanna to touch on the, the top of it. Um, so you had your 05 paper. You mentioned uh, Katie, or I believe one of you, the 05, the 2005 paper that was so seminal, critical in your mind. Can you tell, one of you tell the, the story about what, well, Drew, you told a funny story about why you thought First, why it was seminal, but also, you know, what what you expected would happen after it was published and didn't. 
Yes, uh, uh, Drew is very uh, quiet and modest, and uh, but at that time he said that, oh, you will see that uh, people will call us and we will give lectures and people get interested. And um, because I am always the who think these things, <laughs> but and um, we had um, I had one invitation. I went to Japan and that I gave a lecture there in 2006, and uh, that was the end of it. And then it was, of course, we were working a lot, so we were not sitting and watching the telephone to ring or get an email. But um, it seemed that uh, people were not interested and excited. And of course, we worked and demonstrated that it translates well. We worked on the purification. We worked on many parts of it. But, uh, you know, it was um, not that um, we, back it. we knew that it was important and it will one day it will be. Right, uh, right. True. I assume you agree with that since that's how, kind of how I heard from you originally on it. Yeah, you know, my, my assumption when the paper was published that people would read it and say, oh, wait, th they cracked the, the RNA problem and everybody would be interested, but th very few people yeah. were, were interested. Yeah, no, I know I, in the New York Times podcast, uh, you were asked, uh, I believe there was, you know, champagne to open, right? And Katie, you said, I have never kept champagne in my fridge. I know scientists who did, I have not, <laughs> which I loved. Um, related question then, next question. You have unbelievable persistence. I think everyone knows the story has read anything or heard anything about you, both of you. You know, how did you keep going? And this is important for all humans and all of our students here and me actually too, anyone. How did you go? How did you keep going? Why didn't you say, I'm not doing this anymore? You know, as you know, or as we know, Katie, particularly you lost a couple of lab heads and you kept having to say, I need a new seat. Please can I have at Penn a new lab head? Cause they kept leaving. And you stayed, and it was tough getting grants. Drew, you had some grants, but Katie, I know it was tough in general, both of you, to get them. I mean, how did why, how did you get going? How did you keep going? Why, why did you why didn't you say I'm not doing this anymore? I mean, uh, uh, from our part, we could see progress, and actually, before Drew came, I almost ten years I was working on this uh, RNA, and. Um, and I could see, uh, you know, the RNA structure get better, more protein was made. But in eventually, what I was doing from early on, I uh, read in um, uh, high school this uh, Hans Scheyer's book, uh, and he he coined the word uh, stress in the uh, 1930s, and uh, he said that uh, stress can kill you but not really the way that we think, but it is how you perceive. And he said that life without stress is actually boring. You won't even get up in the morning. So believe or not, you need stress. But he explained that you have to make it a, a negative stress to positive, and, which is inspiration rather than you know, depression or something. Mm -hmm. And so any, any, any kind of news, can, you can find some positive thing in. And um, he also said one thing, which maybe the student could have, uh, will have them. So he said that uh, you have to concentrate on things that you can change. So I literally, many times I said in the lab that, you know, it is everything is here and I just have to make the best experiment. And uh, I did not pay attention that the other person maybe, you know, work less, uh, earn more and promote it. Because immediately somebody pay attention and comparing uh, their performance with the others, already something that they cannot change, but already destruction, yeah. and then they get disappointed. So right. that's what I would say. Right. Just focus on what you can do. Right. Uh, Drew, I assume you're okay with that uh, too. Um, yeah, no, I know one of you said that rejection was actually a motivator for you. It was like a double-edged sword, which is really a fabulous way to look at, at rejection, which we all encounter. But, uh, and I also remember this expression, no pressure, no diamonds. So I think you'd like that one. Um, okay, well, I want to, we all want to be like you in our next lives. Um, so that's, um, let's see, quickly flash forward to 2020, COVID-19. What happened when it emerged? How were you involved? Did you anticipate the use for your research and that, you know, it would take 10 months to produce 95% effective vaccines. That's a long one, but you can be brief. <laughs> so you know, we had been working on vaccines for 
seven plus years. Uh, and, and other companies, Moderna, BioNTech, CureVac, we're all working on RNA vaccines. Some use similar different platforms. I think everybody who work with RNA recognize its potential for use in emergent situations because making an RNA vaccine is incredibly fast. The, the pharmaceutical production is easy, easily scalable. So it, you know, in our minds and, and in everybody else's, it made complete sense to use RNA for a vaccine for COVID. I was nervous when the phase three trial results were about to be released because we had worked on 20 plus vaccines, uh, different vaccines and different animal models. And in just about every one of them, we had 100% efficacy. So the vaccine worked great for flu, for C. diff, for norovirus, for uh, uh, genital herpes, for, for just about every pathogen we looked at. So, but I, I was incredibly nervous because as researchers, we know what works in mice rarely works in humans. So I, you know, when those results came out, I was relieved that we had 95% efficacy because the, the big fear is what works in, in animal models doesn't work in people. Mm -hmm. When I heard the results, you know, I, I, they were fantastic, but I was mostly relieved. Yes, yes, and you had the vision. I mean, Katie, I assume you agree with that. Yes, 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 yeah. uh, actually, yes. I, I was uh, working at BioNTech, you know, I started here and, uh, eight years ago, and so um, I was participating in the development of uh, mm -hmm. influenza vaccine, but uh, my major focus was always to use messenger RNA coding for therapeutic protein, and this was actually originally when we worked with Drew, was uh, the reason that we start to see that whether we, why the RNA immunogenic, how we can make it non-immunogenic, because for therapeutic purposes, when uh, for stroke and other diseases you want to use, you don't want to use uh, mRNA that causes inflammation and uh, and even in the BioNTech, I was responsible for developing mRNA for uh, therapeutic purposes. And uh, actually one is already entered clinical trial uh, two years ago. And so I was not uh, the vaccine expert, but um, I also had to optimize the formulation, the mRNA, uh, but we worked together with uh, Pfizer and uh, it was the influenza vaccine. Mm -hmm. So, um... Some, some of this you can't answer, Katie, because I, I know you're at BioNTech, but maybe you can, Drew. You know, can you give us a little um, idea about the next possible uses for the mRNA technique? And, uh, and you know, it's unfair, but any outlook, for, this is an unfair question for you, it's not what you do, but any outlook for either of you for the course of this pandemic and, and possible variants? So we, we're working on many different RNA therapeutics. We've got uh, 20 plus vaccines that we're working on. We have vaccines for allergic diseases. So for, for treating peanut allergies, dust mites and other allergens. We have vaccines for autoimmune diseases. Uh, we have vaccines for malaria, TB, many different viruses and bacteria. The, the most exciting new stuff coming out of our lab is therapeutics for gene therapy. So we, we figured out how to target specific cells. So we're looking at treating things like sickle cell anemia by injecting RNA LNPs that will fix the, the defective genes in bone marrow stem cells. And, and to me, that, that's incredibly exciting because currently the way those diseases are treated for gene therapy is you have to take bone marrow out of a person, infect it with a Lenny virus and give it back. For sickle cell, there's 200,000 people a year born with sickle cell in Sub-Saharan Africa. You can't do 200,000 bone marrow biopsies. 
So th this offers an easy in vivo gene therapy that to me is incredibly exciting and groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so funding uh, and policy recommendations, you all have really struggled. I think that's not an exaggeration to get where you did and you had this persistence that's gorgeous over 40 years. Do you think out of that and out of the tremendous <clears throat> success of, of that work, uh, that funding and support for research will improve and that the do policy recommendations briefly. Katie, you have any ideas or? Yes, yeah. So, you know, that everything is kind of, uh, when I think back, is, is, a, is a double as Because um, if somebody has all of the money and tenured and some, maybe they are sit back. It depends on the person. Of course, not Drew, but, uh, you know, some people who, who might have well funding and, but when you have that, uh, you have one year to work as much as you can to get uh, money and to mm, preserve your job and then uh, do the research what you are doing. And, you know, it, it is <laughs> inspiring you a little bit more. And um, I never had uh, any job security. And, um, and I, my, my example is uh, unusual in these days because uh, even at the age of 58 at Penn, you know, I did the, all of the experiment with my own hands. Uh, I run the gel, defrost the freezer, run for pick up the radioactive material. I did every part, uh, seeded the cells, uh, write the paper, read the publications, others. And so um, usually people had big laboratories, but uh, at the beginning we drew, we work uh, shoulder to shoulder. Drew mm -hmm. was seeding the cells, I was making the RNA. And um, so it is very unusual. Usually there are big groups and then they uh, produce. Yeah. And um, so of course it would have helped uh, because I was not a faculty. So I never had students. I never had money to hire somebody. And so this, um, would have, uh, of course, if we get the money, would have been better because we had many ideas that we could uh, explore further. And, uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah. with the limited resources, we try our best. And you succeeded. Drew, anything on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine, although it's possible that the US government is suddenly gonna put more money into basic science research because of the success of the COVID vaccine. That, that's not how government thinks about research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, it, to, to them, research is, is based on how much money is available and how much money they want to put towards NIH versus the military versus something else. Right. So I, I don't think it's going to help increase basic science research money. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we need to clone the two of you. That's what we're going to try to do, figure out how to make you the two of you. Um, OK, we're going to switch to Mindy, who's going to um, moderate the questions and uh, use every minute of this time. Go for it. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, who shared questions. We have a lot of wonderful um, questions. Feel free to keep sending them to me by direct message. We're going to start with um, a question or two questions from the in-person folks. And I'm going to do some combining, since we have a lot of good questions here. Um, so two part question uh, from, these are from two MPA students, John Henry and Elizabeth Burdett, who are both part of the class of 2022 here at Bells. Um, one question, so as medical professionals and researchers, what's the biggest things that politicians and public administrators get wrong about public health? And building on that, what advice, or do you have any advice for pol future policymakers about effectively communicating these topics, um, especially given the current situation? So what do we get wrong and what can we do different? I, mean, I, I think the classic example of what we got wrong was the, the prior president's administration where public policy became a subordinate of getting reelected. And you know, th to put public health in anything but a primary uh, position for determining how to treat a disease it is, is, you know, is terrible. So I, I think 
you know, the, the most important thing for any politician, any government is to listen to the experts, listen to the, what the experts say about how to approach a public health problem. And if we don't do that, if we let, you know, lawyers and business people determine our public health, we're going to be in trouble again. So what, uh, what I learned actually in, uh, in this time, I, I thought also that uh, we as a scientist, uh, I myself also, I like to talk another scientist and uh, uh, I realized that, you know, we, we should have done as a scientist more talking about what we are doing so that it seemed like, you know, the gap between what the public is knowing about what scientists is doing and what we are doing is, is big and then we should have and now that we can do it so that uh, we can learn also to to express ourselves simpler not like uh, using all of these terms scientific terms so that um, we can um, also work on that that part and and you as a communicator and a, a journalist everybody has to learn you know to yeah. to communicate better yeah. although you can't do it all and boy what you've done is the cake. I mean, that's the icing. The cake is impossible and you've done it. Thanks so much. For our next question, we have Joseph Huang, who is a PhD candidate in economics here at Penn. Hey, hello, Katie. Hello, Drew. Thank you so much. Um, so my question is about how does the FDA approval, uh, uh, how does the pro approval process affect your decisions to do research? Would you have any advice to the FDA? They are very strict on drug efficacy and safety, and I'm sure they will have an impact on your research process. Thank you. I mean, it, it, so Katie and I are basic scientists and our, our research, you know, it, from when we started it has, you know, we didn't think of or care about the FDA. We wanted to understand the biology of RNA. And we made findings that were important in understanding and changing the biology of the RNA. You, you deal with the FDA when you're making a drug. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Katie because she works biotech and, and makes drugs that go into clinical trials. I, uh, so, um... I have to tell you that uh, after working like uh, decades at uh, uh, laboratory in uh, universities, uh, coming to uh, at the uh, age of 58 to work for uh, for an industry was uh, <laughs> actually is an uplifting experience. One, you know, I um, I tried to do the basic science, but I realized many things which I thought in the laboratory that so so great ideas. I realized that it will never be a drug because you know the clinical trial, what you measure and and learned all of these things, and um, so I also realized that um, it was. Um, not to make more paper and getting your CV better, but it, you have to create something which effective. And this is, this was a great thing because uh, if it is not effective, then we can all go home and we can close down. And the other thing was uplifting is that we had to, everybody had to work together. It was not like, oh, I am first author, last, there is no author, nothing. It is, we have to, everybody had to put in and it was, uh, you know, somehow I wish that in the university also that, um, uh, you know, everybody need, uh, you know, have a grants and then for their grants, they need, uh, you know, have a uh, promotion and whatnot. But there is the, who cares? We have to have to work together and have to have a product which is, uh, which is, effective and that that was that was a good feeling for me and of course it was also that um i just could get something for the team that uh, you, you know i didn't have to submit just i have to say that we need that and that we could get it and mm -hmm. 
yeah, but uh, I was not uh, thinking authorities too much because what I did here also a little bit similar what I, you know, basic research, we try to improve the uh, RNA, which uh, making more protein and, uh, mm -hmm. and the two years actually interesting. We worked that to make the same thing we did at Penn because one of my colleague, Hiromi Muramatsu came with me that we will introduce here BioNTech, the modified nucleoside modified RNA. And we worked two years just to do the same we could do pen, but it is industrially scalable way. So that um, the purification, the modification, everything what we did had to be scalable. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was a little bit, um, yeah, <laughs> difficult that we are doing the same, but we cannot do certain, we, you cannot precipitate some, you know, the RNA, which we have done in the lab. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. I remember you also said that your CEO at BioNTech really, uh, at a crossroads, really made a difference to you. Um, and, you know, I love that for our students to hear that it's okay to go to the private sector. You know, it's okay because together, you know, you're so much stronger than one or the other. Okay, yes. Mindy. Oh, sorry, Drew, did you want to say something? No, I'll, I'll set. Okay, Mindy. All right, thanks for our next question. We've got, I'm gonna do another combo from Montana Tamney and Nicole Schneider, who are both um, MPA class of 2022 students. Uh, so this is sort of about misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. First part, so what's the experience been like watching so many people deny scientific research, saying that vaccines don't work? You know, is there a solution to that? And then there was a lot of class discussion recently about promoting vaccine and um, overcoming misinformation, what do you wish the government would do, if anything, to address the challenges? I mean, I, I, I don't think it's, it. so the, the, the source of the problem isn't government. Uh, the, the source of the problem in my mind is the ability of social media to rapidly spread false information and a large group of people in the United States that would rather believe a crazy social media person instead of a scientist. It, it, you know, I, I think a telling point is people have investigated the lead vaccine misinformation people. Uh, th there's 12 physicians who account for a large percentage of all vaccine misinformation. But if you look at who they are, many of them sell made up homeopathic drugs for treating COVID-19. And they've become multimillionaires by, you know, by, by spreading vaccine misinformation, which helps sell their drugs. So the, the vaccine misinformation starts with people trying to make money and is spread by people who like conspiracy theories. I might just add something to it uh, that it is not new thing. 100 years ago when Röntgen discovered, you know, that the uh, x-ray will go through the flash and you can see the bones, actually people uh, fear was uh, generated that uh, people will use like a binocular in the theater and they can see through your clothes. And so then uh, in England, people start to sell underwears, which was written that it was x-ray resistant. They didn't say that it goes through the flesh. So people get very rich on generating fears that people will see you without clothes. And actually there was a petition was submitted that in the binocular in the theater cannot have x-ray in it. Well, wow. so there was always like that, just, you know, the social media, what Drew said, it made it huge. And that time, you know, the news didn't spread that easily in a hundred years ago when the Röntgen was mm -hmm. introduced. Well, that's great context. Gives us a little hope that we'll get, we'll get through this. Uh, Mindy. Great. For our next question, we have Mike Holt, who is a graduate from the uh, Fells MPA class of 2020. Um, you there, Mike? Yep. Hi, sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute for a second. Um, yeah, so thank you both for coming in. Um, so I'm actually uh, working um, 
I'm an alum and working in the government on the vaccine rollout. And one of the discussions um, that's you know been had a lot in both the news and, and in government is about you know globally health equity and how many countries um, you know don't have as successful vaccination rates as in the U.S. and Europe, and that you know there are, are countries where it's, it's incredibly low. And so there's talk about what public health institutions uh, and pharmaceutical companies can do in terms of either releasing formulations or, or sending more vaccine supply. Um, and so I was just curious what, what you both think and from both a scientific lens and then from a societal lens, you know, if there's more that we as a country should be doing to help those in, in other countries get vaccinated. And it, it's, your question is enormous and we could spend hours talking about it. You know, the, the, the current problem is vaccine availability. So, in, you know, I believe in Africa, 3% of the population has been vaccinated. And it's not because they're resistant, it's because they don't have vaccine. And if you don't have vaccine, you can't vaccinate. Uh, uh, on the other end, you've got countries like Spain that are 85% vaccinated and countries like the United States that are, you know, 60% in Germany which I, I think is a little bit better, but not much. So, you know, th th there's two main problems. One is getting vaccine to the population. And the second is getting the population to take the vaccine. And, and both of those have to be addressed, uh, but they're very different problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when, when you know, also uh, uh, globally, they discussed that how you can help and um, setting up uh, factories, you have to consider that they have to be sustainable. And today you need billions of vaccine, but if it is the pandemic is over, was what thing that, what those will do so that they have to s be sustainable. And those people who are working there had to be um, taught and those who should uh, show them how to do things, they are working day and night to make the vaccine. So they, um, for the next thing coming, uh, probably um, it would be much better, but right now that um, this is a, a limitation uh, um, because I think that um, um, 60 million vaccine has to be made by a facility uh, in every year when there is no pandemic, now is big demand, the demand that uh, to be sustainable. So the people stay there with the knowledge and everything. And, uh, and then they, when they had to scale up that they would be able to scale up. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Molly Robbins, who's a community member from Gladwin Montessori School. She's asking, are young leaders have the opportunity to follow their curiosities in sciences and all aspects of their learning? I'm interested in hearing what both of you have, um, what you remain most curious about as scientists and researchers, and what you hope the next generation of scientists will be driven to explore. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, uh, uh, so that, um, um, as I mentioned <laughs> in elementary school, we did the little crystals. And I remember that even at, at Penn working and sometimes in a salt uh, solution, I could see a crystal. It's frozen. In Germany, do you want to jump in while she unfreezes? Sure. Yeah, we so, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, undergraduate students. I, I often will have college students uh, in my lab because my job is to train new researchers, to train people to take over and become the researchers of the future. So I, I, I take that very seriously. Now, you know, I, I have no idea what people will be studying in 10 years um, because it, it's driven by what we're studying right now, what the new breakthroughs are, et cetera. But I think my job is to put them in the lab and give them the experience so they can make the decision, do they want to do this for the rest of their lives? 
And is this something they want to do? So I, I like to start when they're college students. I have had high school students as well. And I think that's critical for all labs to do. Thank you. And hopefully Great. we'll be able to get yeah, Katie back. Hopefully we'll get Katie back. Maybe you know. Thanks. Drew, you're on. This is great. Okay. Go yeah. ahead for it. Uh, Mindy, go ahead. All right. I think maybe we have time for one more before uh, I know Elizabeth always gets the last question. Yeah. So I'm going to ask one. Uh, switching back to you guys personally, what has it been like to go from you know relative obscurity or privacy to this global recognition? How has it affected you positively or negatively receiving all the awards and all of the um, attention? Yes, yeah, so my, my family gives me a hard time about this because I, I'm shy, I'm quiet. I, I like to sit in my lab and work. Uh, I, I, Katie and I spent last week with the King and Queen of Spain uh, receiving unbelievable amounts of attention and I, I certainly wasn't comfortable uh, with the attention. I, I don't think I ever will be. Uh, I, I'm happy just sitting in my lab working. Uh, but you know, I, I, I accept the the attention because my wife will kill me if I don't. <laughs> Drew, there's a great article and it's public, so you got to tell that story about your wife. Can you just tell that quick story about when she was talking to you? It's public. Uh, so uh, the, 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 this is probably, uh, she'll tell it better, but in, in the first year or two of our marriage, um, my, my wife uh, started to, you know, we had talked uh, and then it was a few hours later and she came back and started to talk to me again. And I turned to her and says, well, wait a minute, we've already talked today. And, and she joked, that I, I'm good for about 20 words a day, and that's it. <laughs> Actually, I might add to that that once uh, we discussed with the result we drew, and you know, our children were sometimes in the lab because they had vacation or something, and and uh, Drew's daughter was there, and we discussed that what should we do, and that and that, and and Drew looked up and he said that my daughter probably is uh, 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 shocked here because. Uh, yeah, she has never seen me talk so much. <laughs> that was great. And then was Drew told me that uh, his wife said, probably it is limited how many words he can say one day. <laughs> but thank God he's working so hard and living in his brain and changing the world. Um, Katie, you missed the beginning of that. Thing. Welcome back, by the way. I think we lost you for a minute. But the question really was, um, has your life changed? You know, how have you adapted to how it's changed? And I want, a quick I want you to tell the quick Goober story. Will you do that, please? We, we, which story? Goobers, the Goobers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I don't have to go too far because even in Germany, I was giving out Goobers. To All right, my... well, we know when to send you, yeah. But the, even, the, you know, eight years ago when I came, I always, although they have milk or chocolate, but you know, they have, I always brought Goobers <laughs> for, the, for them. And so they knew that, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it was um, uh, when, when I learned on the day that um, on uh, November 8th, uh, Sunday, that um, the, came out the phase three result and everything was so great. And, uh, and I told my husband that I, I thought so. And I, I said that, you know, I will eat the whole, you know, the whole box uh, uh, of chocolate <laughs> covered peanut and this goobers actually uh, is from philadelphia you know that it was uh, oh, great. Uh, german uh, german uh, um, uh, chocolatier people they created the goobers yeah but uh, for us yeah so uh, sometimes i want my old life back you know the quiet uh, days uh, but um, you know, we, we drew, we tried to make our best, you know, to educate the public and uh, draw attention to science and the teachers and, and the research. And um, so, yeah, we try to yeah. make uh, and yeah. help make it helpful. Yeah, well, make sure you preserve yourselves. We need you to keep doing the research. The rest of it, we can, we can talk for you, but we can't do what you do. So my la the last question, which I always get, as Mindy said, thank you. Um, and then we'll let you go to sleep. It's a four, three minutes up. 
and then you need to sleep and I hope to sleep on the plane. Um, anyway, uh, I know you said once um, that it's, and it's apropos of what you just said, that if you could, if, if there were a choice between being famous and not having this pandemic exist, you wouldn't want to be famous. So again, so, so admirable, both of you. So here's the question. Um, I know you, I mentioned that I would ask you this. So, and it's always my last question. Our students, as I said, want to be you and I do too in our next, in your next, in the next life. What, what, either two ways to look at this, what recipe do you think created you, honestly, uh, from the very beginning, your incredible drive and humility and persistence? And, or if you'd rather answer it this way, I always ask, what life lessons for our students and us who will pursue other fields besides yours, no doubt, um, what life lessons, a few, two or three that you've learned, would you like to tell your 25 year old self? So, so when they uh, actually recently students ask how to be su so successful, I mean, uh, this is not uh, what about science, what we are here in the spotlight. You know, the science is uh, to be in the lab thinking and enjoying uh, solving problems. And uh, so you have to, the every day, because that was for, for me 40 years. So I didn't thought about that it happens. You have to enjoy what you are doing. And we agree with Drew on that, that, uh, um, you know, that's science and you have to enjoy that, what you are doing. and. Um, and if something is good that you just keep uh, doing it and uh, and uh, what i mentioned before don't look at that others are uh, you know proceeding and uh, promoted and whatnot you know just uh, do what you can do and enjoy great advice great advice true so i i mean i i don't consider the past year and a half success to, to me Success is having a, a 35 plus year career where I published good papers that investigated important points that made good contributions to basic science uh, every year. And, and to me, that's success. It's, it's to be a, a consistent scientist mm -hmm. who investigates interesting things mm -hmm. and helps advance the field. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the rest of the world sees success because all of a sudden we're, you know, we're, we're in every newspaper and, and mm -hmm. TV show. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm sure Katie would agree. Mm -hmm. Success for us is, is, is a lifetime of contributing to science and advancing mm -hmm. the field. Right. Well, I want to say we are grateful that you feel that way, the two of you. Uh, and that you came upon the planet for us. But we are grateful for the last year and a half as well, because all over the world, uh, you have saved lives and you have protected the rest of us. So blessings on you. Thank you. Go back to work. Preserve yourselves. Don't, uh, you know, don't travel all the time because we need you for a lot more decades. So thank you. And thank you for being here at Penn. And we hope, uh, hope to hear lots from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank night, you. night, night, night over there, and in the, and to you as well, Drew, in New York. Bye, bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, students. Go and set the world on fire. Bye. Bye, bye.